the person is perhaps our central ethical concept, the one that we use most frequently in this culture to express uh, moral veneration. In our common sense ethical thinking, the, per the person is the being with dignity, whose status as an agent needs to be respected. It is the person who matters equally with other people and whose voice is as precious as each other person's voice. And yet, none of us has ever, over the whole course of our moral education, been taught how to be a person. We have always been taught, instead, how to be boys and girls, men or women. We, every one of us has learned to be a man or a woman, but none of us has ever learned to be a person. Small wonder then that many of us are such bad people. We have been trained to trained to use and cultivate the character traits of, the, of an excellent. Sorry, we have never been trained to use and cultivate the character traits of an excellent person. We've been too busy learning so-called masculine virtues and feminine virtues to learn the virtues most appropriate to the human person as such. We have been taught to be and to relate to each other as men and women at the expense of learning how to exercise our own personhood and how to respect the personhood of others. Thank you. In their landmark 1869 work of feminist philosophy, The Subjection of Women, John Stuart Mill wrote, quote, what is now called the nature of women is an eminently artificial thing, the result of forced repression in some directions, unnatural stimulation in others. In the case of women, a hothouse and stove cultivation has always been carried on of some of the capabilities of their nature for the benefit and pleasure of their masters. Then, because certain products of the general vital force sprout luxuriantly and reach a great development in this heated atmosphere and under this active nurture and watering, while other shoots from the same root, which are left outside in the wintry air with ice purposely heaped all around them, have a stunted growth, and some are burnt off with fire and disappear, men, with that inability to recognize their own work which distinguishes the unanalytic indolently believe that the tree grows of itself in the way they have made it to grow, and that it would die if one half of it were not kept in vapor bath and the other half in snow." End quote. Now, Mill's most immediate concern here was to deny that we can know what women are naturally like by observing them in conditions of subordination. But in the process of making this point, they give an account of gendered socialization as the process of, quote, forced repression in some directions, unnatural stimulation in others, that I find helpful for understanding how today's men and women might look from the point of view of mono androgynous idea of ethical personality. Female people are raised into women by having certain of their capacities, both in their emotional expression, nurturance and care, orientation, etc., overdeveloped, and while others are neglected. The production of men from the raw materials of male bodies is the mirror image of this process, where the traits associated with femininity are left out in the snow in those imagery. While others, the impulses toward competitiveness, aggression, and various forms of mastery are given a bigger battle. Women are trained to take up little space, men to take up a lot of space. I'll be coming back to this thing about how much space we're taught. When measured against monoandrogeny's ideal of a complete and virtuous human person, the resulting gendered specimens might look like broken fragments of old men, estranged from themselves and from their own other natures. Okay, Brandon, you win. I'm leaving out the hard drive now. <laughs> now, you might say, is being a man or a woman really as bad as all that as I've been making it sound in mean, no. Surely men and women don't, don't measure up against some androgynous, uh, mono androgynous yardstick of ideal person that nobody has ever really used. 
but perhaps those are the wrong standards to apply to them. According to this line of response, the way to figure out whether men or women are good is not to consider them as genderless human beings who are expected to exercise genderless virtues, but as men and women who ought to be assessed by how well they exercise the virtues proper to beings of their kinds, namely the so-called masculine and feminine virtues. This line of response is drawn from a very traditional outlook. I don't have the time to give a complete argument against it here, but here's a quick sketch that should give you a sense of what a developer would like. I begin by observing that the expectations associated with these gendered virtues, if they really exist, will frequently tend to come into conflict with the demands of some more general requirements of good human conduct. Now, if there are some virtues whose exercise makes for a fine human life full stop, and other virtues which are more properly feminine than unrestrictedly human, then we can imagine conflicts in which an agent is caught between the demands of some human virtue and the demands of some gender virtue. Which virtue should she prioritize? Say, she must decide whether to show courage, a human virtue, or submissiveness, allegedly a feminine virtue. Surely it is more important to be a good person than to be a good woman, for two reasons. First, Submissiveness is a dubious virtue in the first place. And second, prioritizing the feminine virtue over the more generally human one would amount to privileging femininity over humanity. That is, privileging the demands of a social rule over the exercise of human excellence. It cannot be more important to be a good wife or a good man than to be a good person, because nothing is more important than being a good person. So it looks like even if there are gendered virtues, they cannot be genuine rivals for the human excellences held up by the androgynous. However attached we may have become to our manhood or womanhood, the forms of goodness associated with them are no match for the highest excellences that call us as human persons. You know, this means that if we are to live the best lives we can, we cannot allow our attachments to our gender identities to override our commitment to human virtue. But, and here's a second sort of objection to this one on the idea. What about someone who doesn't care about living the best life possible, who, who is prepared to, that somebody who's prepared to settle for just avoiding doing a lot of evil? I would suggest that even this less ethically ambitious person has reason to worry about the ethical ramifications of their gender footprint. We know, we know that men are trained to take up a lot of space, as I mentioned before, and women are raised to take up very little. For a vivid illustration of this, you can look at the Tumblr of men taking up too much space on the train. <laughs> uh, for a discussion of the ways that um, feminine bodily comportment involves taking up very little space, you should read the great Chicago This all fits in nicely with Mill's characterization of masculine socialization in the family as a school of despotism. Men are being trained to take up a lot of space to run things. Men are raised to be the dominant caste, women the subordinate. But new research indicates what a deep and insidious imprint this inegalitarian socialization leaves on gender behavior. New work on the ergonomics of dishonesty by M.D shows that people who are accustomed to taking up a great deal of space are more likely to steal, to cheat, and to park their cars illegally. No lie, this research has just been done. Those who are, those who are trained to take up more than their, than their share of space come to feel entitled to more than their share of other things. Leaping ahead of this research, I suspect that its conclusions will generalize in collaborative ways. Those who are empowered to take up more space will feel entitled to take up more class time, as anyone who spent much time in the classroom knows intuitively. To spend other people's money, as we saw in the ancient financial crisis. To speak out of turn, as in street harassment. And to feel entitled to others' bodies, like those who broke strangers on the subways. 
This is not to say that if you are a man or if, like me, you were socialized masculine willy-nilly, you are fated by socialization to do evil. The monoandrogynous point is, is rather that perhaps people would be better off and our society would be fairer if we were not actively assigning people to social roles in which they are implicated with that level of privilege and presumption. Most of all, it is to say that those of us with masculine histories and tendencies must start to do what so many of us have been unwilling to do, to treat our identities themselves as an ethical problem, to begin to change from within, to question the unearned prerogatives of man, to train ourselves in behaviors and dispositions more consonant with love and justice. So now, for a few minutes, I've been critical of the polyandrogynous strand of thought that animates the trans liberation movement because I think it encourages us to be too forgiving of the ethical failings which pure masculinity and femininity routinely require of us. In this respect, I try to echo feminism's recommendation that we allow ourselves to grow into a more complete form of person, unfettered by the limiting and oppressive pseudo virtues that traditionally define successful performances of mathematical women. However, because I want my lecture to be read in trans feminist light as a critical message of love to trans kin, I must also distance myself from even some of the wisest voices in contemporary cisgender white feminism. The feminist philosopher Sally Hasslinger, for example, follows Catherine McKinnon in viewing gender difference as we know it as essentially or primarily instrument of domination. Accordingly, Haslinger recommends that we refuse to be gendered men or women and work toward a society in which whatever gender differences survive are non hierarchical I agree with them that the genders of the future must be non hierarchically related to each other, but I differ from Haslinger in imagining a greater role for individuality and self-expression in the non hierarchical genders of tomorrow. I suppose that is because I share the contemporary trans liberations movement's polyandrogynous conviction that although gender differences as they have come down to us are implicated with domination, they are precious in spite of this because they enlarge the space of individuality. While a good deal of white cisgender feminism can see difference only as a source of dominance and so concludes that it should be canceled out for the sake of equality, I believe that as trans people, we must absorb the wisdom of Audre Lorde, who urged us to learn to view difference as a source of strength and deepening connection. I conclude with a word about the promise of trans modes of life for feminism. As I have said, feminism as a social movement insists that the aspects of gender difference that reinforce hierarchy need to be rooted out, even when it feels like we need those differences to lead Trans people have a special opportunity to spearhead these efforts. Trans people have a special opportunity to spearhead these efforts. Since we are the ones who have gone the furthest in making our genders projects of deliberate self-cultivation, as trans people, all of us take that first step demanded by both the mono and polyandrogenous features. All of us say, I will not allow the shape of my body at birth to determine my social destiny, how I will occupy space, how I will relate to others, which of my talents I will cultivate. In this area of my life, I must forego the ease and comfort of occupying a ready-made social role and, and an established position in the existing gender hierarchy in order to live by the light of values that are authentically my own. Trans technologies of living are thus vital to feminism, and feminism must learn to cherish trans people as its own self.